Thanks, Carol. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. If he moves, you'll let me know, right? <laughs> I'm a little nervous standing here with him over my shoulder. I'm excited today as we wrap up this series that we've called One and Done, working with the single chapter books of the Bible. This morning, we're looking at the last of them. It's the next to last book in the Bible. It's the book of Jude. And um, I want to introduce you to Jude before we read the book together. We really don't know where he was, nor do we know for sure exactly when he wrote the book. There is nothing in the scriptures to pinpoint that for us. What we do know with fair degree of accuracy is that Jude is the brother of Jesus. In the Gospels, there are four brothers that are named, and he appears to be the baby brother. He's the last in the list. Uh, Jesus had at least four uh, half-brothers and at least two sisters, according to the Gospels. And so those siblings did not become believers during Jesus' earthly ministry. The Bible tells us in John chapter 7 that his brothers did not believe in him but Jesus appeared to his oldest brother, James, after the resurrection, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And that's really interesting because James would be, he would be the one person in all the world who could not be duped. He could not be fooled. And so for Jesus to appear to the oldest of his brothers... And then apparently through that to reach all of his brothers and sisters and have them come to faith in Jesus is very significant. The best estimates are that the book of Jude is written somewhere around between 65 and 75 A.D. There is no mention of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And so most people put it right ahead of that date. So somewhere in the late 60s. The half-brother of Jesus who has become a believer and an itinerant preacher, is writing to the church. And he had determined that he was going to write on one subject, but as he sat down to do that, the Spirit of God impressed on him a more pressing problem. And so we're going to read about that problem this morning. I invite you to stand, if you will, as we read together the book of Jude and his exhortation to contend for the faith. When people read that, and you'll see it in the third verse as we read together, when people read that, they immediately think boxing gloves or swords and spears and contending in that way. But I, wanna, I want us to consider something else today as we go through it. So, as we have been doing, I'll read the white print. You join me, please, and we'll, together we'll read the yellow print. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in, in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I desire... Uh, to remind you, though, excuse me, I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, 
are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet, in the same way, these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they, do, they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. Clouds without water, carried along by winds. Autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It was also said about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the same last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of the glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> As I said, when people think of the book of Jude, almost everyone who is familiar with it thinks of the phrase, earnestly contending for the faith. And the idea that comes across often when we're looking at that is the idea of defending the faith that contending for the faith has the idea of being an apologist, a defender, someone who is um, standing up for correct doctrine, someone who is, in some cases, fighting against false doctrine. And so the imagery of boxing gloves or of swords and spears and so on. Uh, William Wilberforce made the statement, Christianity has been successfully attacked and marginalized because those who professed belief were unable to defend the faith from attack, even though its attackers' arguments were deeply flawed. And so there are many who have taken the task of becoming apologists and defenders for the faith, and that's a good thing. The faith of Jesus Christ, the truth of God's Word, is logical, it is defensible, it is reasonable. And so it's very possible to argue and to defend the faith. In my judgment, however, that
That is not what Jude is talking about. I don't think he's talking about that. The word contend is a very interesting word. It's a hapax. Um, if you want to impress your friends with your knowledge of Greek, you can tell them that the contend earnestly is a hapax. That means it's only used once in all the Bible. And so this word, epagonizomai, is a hapax. It's used just one time in all the Bible. Now, when you look at that, if you look carefully, you can see the word agonize in the middle. See it there? And to ep agonize means to agonize with great intensity. So Vine, in his book, writes this. He says that, that this word contend signifies to contend about a thing as a combatant upon or about intensive. And agon is a contest. Agonize is the Greek verb to labor or to strive. The word earnestly is added to convey the intensive force of the preposition. So it means to, to agonize, to labor, to strive with great um, effort. And so it's used in several, in, in only this place in the book of Jude. But the verb itself, agonizomai, without the preposition attached to it, is used a number of times in the Bible, and I've listed three of them here for us on the screen. It's used in 1 Corinthians 6.12 which speaks of an aggressive contest that someone is working hard. It's used in Colossians 1.29, where Paul says, according to the wisdom and the, and the purpose of my mission, I strive with great earnestness to present all men complete in Christ. Or in Colossians 4.12, interestingly enough, it's used of Epaphras, and Paul writes and says of him that he's always laboring earnestly in prayer for you Colossians. And so the word is used primarily in the New Testament of a spiritual labor, a spiritual agonizing in the sense of somebody who is, who is laboring earnestly to accomplish some things of a spiritual nature. I, uh, I think that that's what Jude has in mind here. He's not talking so much about fighting against false teachers as he is in, in contending earnestly against the ungodly influence of Christians around us. And I think I can demonstrate this as we move through the book here in a moment. It's interesting to me, if you were to take commentaries or if you go to the computer and you look up the book of Jude, everybody says to you that what's happening in the book of Jude is that Jude is writing about false teachers. And we do have information in God's word about false teachers. Jesus made the statement that you see here in Matthew chapter 7 about being aware of false teachers. And Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 says, but false teachers also arose among the people, the Old Testament generation, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them. And so all the commentaries that I could find say that Jude and 2 Peter are saying the same thing, that they are struggling against false teachers. And then I noticed something really odd. Not once does Jude mention teachers. He doesn't use false prophets. He doesn't use false teachers. He doesn't even use the word teach. He simply says there are ungodly men who have crept in among us. And in my judgment, Jude is not talking about the problem with false teachers. Because if false teachers are among us, they might, they might slip in initially, but if they're teaching in a false way, they become apparent. People notice that. What he's talking about it's not false teachers, but false livers. Not the kind of liver you have here, right? But people who live a false Christian life. And that fits with the doxology. Many people use the, um, the blessing at the end 
of the book of Jude as, a, as sort of a doxology or a closing, a, a benediction for a service. Notice what he says. He says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. Jude is writing to believers about a problem that is a perennial problem in churches almost from day one. And that problem is that there are people who come in and they slip in, they sort of sneak in. He says, they've crept in among us. And they are people who appear to be individuals who love Jesus and they talk a good talk, but they don't live it. Instead, they are individuals who will lead other Christians astray. And so I want us to think about Jude as he talks about contending for the faith. And I want you to see three things that he shares with us in terms of this contending for the faith. Jude likes threes. I'll show you that in a second. The first thing he says is that if we're going to contend for the faith, it requires of us a holy fear. It requires a holy fear on our part. He says these ungodly persons have crept in. Um, at the very beginning, he says three things about the believers that they are kept in Jesus, that they, are, that they are redeemed and so forth. And then he invokes three things. He invokes mercy, um, peace, and love. And then he's going to give us three examples here as he talks about these individuals. And as you go through the book, it's very interesting, all of the threes that he uses. So it underscores the fact that we ought to have three-point sermons um, because he likes threes. We like threes too. These un ungodly persons have crept in. See what he says? While I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, our common deliverance, he wanted to write a doctrinal treatise. But he says, I, I felt the necessity to write to you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once, once and for all handed down to the saints. To contend earnestly for the faith is not to contend earnestly that you will have faith it's to contend earnestly for the proper teaching of God's word. To contend for the faith means that, that you are very careful to maintain the proper faith that was given by Jesus and the disciples and the Apostle Paul and others. So to strive earnestly or to contend earnestly means to maintain the proper faith beliefs. And there are two problems that these people have. First, they turn grace into self-indulgence. Maybe you know people like that. They are individuals who say, we are saved by grace, and so we have the freedom to do all sorts of things. And they engage in things that they know deep down inside are wrong. They just know by instinct he says later on. They, they just know in, intuitively that they're wrong things. But they argue, we're saved by grace, and so we have the freedom to do these things. And what happens is they lead other Christians down that path. I've watched it happen. I've watched it happen right here at Graceway. Individuals who don't like something and who just... Dis, dis, desire and determine that they're going to live a certain lifestyle, and so they live a certain way, taking advantage of the grace of God. I don't know if you've ever asked the question. I've asked the question on occasion. How can a person who is saved by grace, who has, been, who has received the forgiveness and the awesomeness that God has given, live like that? How can a person do that? And the answer is, they turn grace into self-indulgence. They take liberties that if Jesus were actually present, they wouldn't take. And I watch that happen. Sometimes I see it happening in your life. And I suppose I'm probably prone to do that on some occasions too. 
But that's what, that's what Judas concerned about. He's not concerned about somebody who's behind a lectern somewhere who is teaching the false view of, of, of Jesus, like John was in 2 John, or like, um, like Peter is in 2 Peter. He's concerned about the person next to you who turns the grace of God, the wonderful blessings of God's grace, into a freedom to indulge his own flesh and, and thereby infects other people. That's what he's concerned about. And so you and I need to be concerned about that as well. Along with that, he says, not only do they turn the, the grace of God into self-indulgence, but they deny Jesus as master and Lord. In other words, they don't really live their lives under the authority of Jesus. They don't really recognize Jesus as the Lord of their lives. They're, the, they're their own Lord. They live the way they want to live. They do whatever they want to do. And what Jude is saying is, if you're, going to, if you're going to contend for the faith, you have to be alert to that and don't let it happen. Now, notice the examples that he provides of this. He provides some, he says, remember how this happened in the past. All right? First of all, he says, remember what happened to the Exodus generation. These were believers. These were people that God redeemed. He brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt, and he led them across the Red Sea, led them through the wilderness as we studied all of this in the life of Moses back in the spring. And he led them all the way up to the promised land, and what did they do? They said, we're not going in. And so what did God do? He judged them. He turned them around, sent them out into the wilderness until they all died, except for Joshua and Caleb. And then he took the next generation in. You see what he's saying? He's saying it's possible that you could be infected by somebody in the body here who turns the grace of God into self-indulgence or who denies Jesus in reality as the master and Lord of his life, you could be affected by that person. And what, what happens to the generation in the wilderness could happen to you. That's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews says, let's go on to maturity. Be careful that you don't have a hardened heart like that generation in the wilderness back there. You need to continue to trust the Lord. There's a second example that he gives. The second example are the angels who fell. These originally were all believers. Millions upon millions of angels in the heavens. And one day Satan rebelled and we know that a third of the angels followed him in rebellion. And so God has judged those angels for that rebellion. The Bible teaches us that those angels are incarcerated in a place called the, the pit or the abyss. It is a spiritual prison house where these angels are incarcerated until we get to the book of Revelation, until we get halfway through the tribulation period, and they're going to be released, many of them, to torment the earth. But God has imprisoned these angels because of their rebellion. All the ones who turned against him. And then the third example that he uses is Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah occurs in the story of Abraham and Lot. Remember, Lot moved down to Sodom, and he wanted to live there. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, God said, I'm going to judge those cities, Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities around them. And he did it according to the book of Genesis, as an example to Abraham so that Abraham, who was to be the father of many nations, would teach his descendants not to sin as those people sinned. So the example here is not false teachers. The example is people who refuse to walk in accordance with the revelation that they were given, who refuse to walk in obedience to the Lord. And what... what Jude is saying is, if you're going to contend for the faith, you need to have a holy fear. You need to have a right kind of fear of God, 
a fear of, of walking away in some way, a fear of offending what God has laid out in his word. And, and we find this pressure coming all around us. Haven't you felt at times other Christians say to you, oh, it's okay to do that. We're saved by grace. And I'll be the first one to argue we're going to heaven by grace. You're not going to heaven by your good deeds. You're not going to heaven because you're good enough. We're going to heaven because we have been granted the grace of God and the forgiveness of sin and incorporated in the family of God. But that doesn't give us a license to turn that grace into self-indulgence. And that's what, James, that's what Jude, rather, is concerned about, is that there are Christians all over the place who are living like they please. And he doesn't want that to happen. And so he says, I want you to contend for the faith. I want you to have a holy fear. I think the parable of the tares, the wheat and the tares, that Jesus told backs this idea up. Jesus told the parable, remember? And the disciples said, or the, the men in the parable said, well, let's go and we'll pour out, pull out all the tares. And Jesus' answer was, no, don't pull out the tares. You leave them there and God will take care of it in due season. Just know that there are tares among the wheat and that not everybody is what he looks like. And so we need to understand that there are people around us, Christian people, lovely people, who are abusing the grace of God and who are not really living as the servants of Jesus, but they're serving themselves. And you need to be alert. You need to be aware of that. Second thing you need to do if you're going to maintain faith, if you're going to contend for the faith, and that is you have to have a humble spirit. Interesting, as he moves along in the passage, he says that these people, these ones who have crept in among us, have an arrogance about them. Their arrogance with regard to what God has given to them and their uh, view of life and so forth. He says, yet in the same way, these men, also by dreaming, he says, they're out of touch with reality. By dreaming, they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they revile glories. It says in my translation, they revile angelic majesties. The word is really glories. And I think the three things here go back to the three examples we just looked at. To defile the flesh, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. To reject authority, that's the angels who fell. They rejected the authority of God and followed Satan. And to revile glories is to, is, is to reject the glory of God in the presence of the nation of Israel with Moses and, and the cloud and all of the testimony of God, and the people refused to go into the land to take advantage of what God was offering them. So these people live in arrogance to what God is saying. Uh, and, he, and he provides the example. He says, even Michael the archangel didn't do this. If anybody had authority... It would be Michael, the archangel. Archangels, as far as we know, are the highest among the ranks of angels. There are probably two of them. Michael's the only one directly called an archangel. Probably Gabriel's an archangel, maybe. There are these upper-level echelon angels. And he says, when Michael was, was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, so he reveals something to us here that's not revealed anywhere else in the Bible. We know from our study that Moses went up on the mountain when the time came, and he died. And it says in the book of Deuteronomy, God buried him. How did he do that? He did it with Michael. Michael's the one who buried the body of Moses. But when he was ready to bury the body of Moses, Satan came, and he wanted the body. I don't know why. Probably he wanted to make some sort of a shrine that would cause the people to sin or something. I don't know. God determined that Moses' body should be buried in the wilderness without any markers anywhere. Interesting. We all want to put a marker on our grave, right? I want you to come to my grave and pray over my grave someday. Say, thank you, Lord, he's gone. No, no, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> um, God, God sent Michael to bury the body, and when he disputed with the devil... He refused to use his own authority. He says, the Lord rebuke you. 
See the contrast in terms of humility there that he's maintaining with us. And he says, these men, that is, these people who have come in among us, these people who refuse to submit to the authority of God's word, and they may be really sweet and sweet-talking on the outside, but on the inside, they're turning the grace of God into self-indulgence, and they're denying that Jesus is actually their Lord and Master, and they do what they want. He says, they revile what they don't understand. They're missing the point. And so he's arguing that we need to be careful that we have a humble spirit with regard to the teaching of God's word. Secondly, he says these people serve themselves. He says, woe to them. They've gone the way of Cain. They have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam, and they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. See the three examples again? We had the three examples before. Now we have three more examples. He, just, he likes this pattern as he shares it with us. Cain, when he, was, when he was confronted with his sin, instead of humbling himself, he killed his brother. Like, come on. But he, he killed his brother, and God said to him, if you, if you humble yourself, won't you be forgiven? Won't your countenance be lifted up? But he refused to do it. Balaam, you remember the story. Balaam was hired to curse the nation of Israel. And he tried, and God wouldn't let him, so he found a way around it so that for money from Balak, the Moabite king, he provided a way for the nation of Israel to stumble and fall. And then Korah is the one who led the rebellion in the wilderness, and Korah was destroyed by fire from God for that rebellion. He says these people are not really serving the body of Christ. They're serving themselves. So you and I need to be sensitive we're not, I'm not saying I want you to be judgmental. It's not that we go around and we say, oh, you're one of them. It's just that we don't, we don't follow somebody else's influence without thinking about it and without saying, you know, I, I don't know if that's what God really wants. I, I don't know, but maybe that person is not really submitting to the lordship of jesus maybe that person is abusing the grace of god there are all sorts of behaviors all sorts of things that we like to do and we like to we like to indulge ourselves in things and and in doing that to say well i have a right to do this because because i've been saved by grace god is a gracious god and so on and what jude is saying is be careful of that he says they undermine the fellowship of the church see the phrases he uses down here really interesting he says these are hidden reefs in your love feast a hidden reef is a is something that's under the water in the sea and the ships don't see it and when they try to navigate those waters they get caught on them they get shipwrecked like we see back here so these people are hidden reefs these people are real dangers to the true fellowship of the body of Christ. So that means you and I need to be alert to that. They are clouds without water. Right? We could stand that these days in our part of the country right now for a little bit. But in those days, clouds without water were, were kind of a curse. The, the Jewish people lived in a uh, in, in much of this part of the country is sort of a desert-like climate. And when clouds came, that was a great relief. And they were praying for water, praying for rain. And so now we have clouds without water. And so he says those clouds are driven along by the winds, basically conceding the idea that they're useless. Or autumn trees without fruit. You have an apple tree in your backyard, and you can, we just wait all year for September, and you come to pick apples off that tree, and there's no fruit. So there's no, there's, there's no contribution to the body in reality. And then he goes on to say that they, 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 just, don't, they just don't contribute anything. So he's, he's arguing for being aware of these things. He, he goes on to say these people will be judged by God. And he takes a, he, he takes a, a, a quotation from Enoch that we don't have anywhere else. 
There's a similar statement in an pseudepigraphal book of Enoch, but we don't have that statement anywhere else. Jude reveals for us something that otherwise we would not know, that Enoch pronounced judgment on those who take this course of action many ages ago. He pro prophesied this, and he says their ungodly ways will be exposed, and he really underscores the ungodliness. I think ungodly simply means they do not walk according to the Lord himself. He's not talking, my judgment, he's not talking about false teachers. He's talking about false livers. He's talking about people who proclaim to be part of the functioning body of Christ, but who do not really live in the light of that. He says they're fault-finding grumblers. Thirdly, if you're going to contend for the faith, if you're going to maintain genuine biblical faith, there has to be healthy relationships. And so here now he turns to say what you should do in the light of this. And he says three things. One, remember the apostles' warning. Remember that we were told that people like this would come in our midst. He doesn't say, like Peter did, that the apostles warned us about false teachers. He says, the apostles warned us that there will be mockers who will come who follow their own ungodly lusts. And so I think he's, he's underscoring the fact that you and I need to be aware of the fact that not everybody who presents himself as a Christian and says that he is serving Jesus is necessarily doing so. Secondly, he says to replenish your most holy faith. He says, um, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. So we need to be in the Word. We need to be constantly reminding ourselves of this walk of faith, constantly reminding ourselves of what it means to be a genuine follower of Jesus. And then thirdly, he says, restore those who struggle. And so he talks about, he says, have mercy on some who are doubting, others save. I put this on the next slide as well. Have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. So what he's talking about here is helping each other. When you see someone who is struggling, when you see somebody who's being led astray, reach out to that person and allow people to reach out to you. As we, as we help each other, we then avoid this loss of faith. We avoid slipping into the syndrome of the generation that came out of Egypt and so on. So here's how I see it. Contending for the faith means walking with a vibrant Christianity, not allowing ungodly Christians, that is, people who claim to be Christians but who are not really walking with the Lord, not allowing them to lead you away from the godly spiritual living. James' message is different from the message of 2 Peter. He is concerned for the genuine welfare of the body of Christ. And this is something that has consumed him as he writes these words to us. That's why he makes the statement in his benediction, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. That's what he wants. He wants that you and I would not stumble, but rather that we would stand in the presence of God's glory, blameless with great joy. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants in contending for the faith. And he says, this is what God will do if we will allow him to do it. So here's how I put it together. Maintaining genuine biblical faith requires a humble diligence on the part of you and me as individuals. First, to maintain a holy fear of God. To have a right kind of fear of offending God. That's what the Israelites in the wilderness did not have. That's what the angels in their original creation did not have. And so as a result of that, they stumbled. So maintain that holy fear. Maintain a sensitive spiritual balance. It is a tightrope. It's a balance act. 
in terms of our walk with the Lord. It's balancing grace and law. It's balancing liberty and legalism. It's finding the balance in the middle that God has determined for us so that we might please him with how we live. And then be careful to refuse the influence of carnal Christians. You don't always know up front who is carnal. But as you listen to conversation, as you, as you detect attitude, as you are aware of how a person lives, you need to be sensitive to the fact that not every Christian lives under the control of the Spirit of God. And Jude says, contend for the faith. Maintain your genuine biblical faith in how you walk with him. Father, help us as we seek to do that. We don't want to be judgmental. Jude doesn't say we should cut people off. He doesn't say we should execute false teachers. Instead, he says we ought to be aware. We ought to be sensitive. And we should help each other to walk faithfully in that faith once for all delivered by the apostles. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to be those who genuinely love you, who serve Jesus, who appreciate the grace of God so much that we don't want to offend that in any way. Help us if we err to err on the side of safety rather than on the side of self-indulgence. Help us, Lord, to be those who because of our love for you and a love for the faith and a desire to stand before Jesus one day are anxious to be pleasing to you in all that we do. I pray that you'll help us to this end. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Worship team, come please.